Well, I hate to interrupt your football betting for auditing, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm being I'm being facetious. You, you can carry on. You can carry on. Yeah, I, I would see. I would assume you'd be pleased, Tyler, because the, the, the Chiefs the Chiefs won. Yeah, Chiefs yeah. won when they're on the road. So I'm dying yeah. yeah, well, I guess that's unfortunate when you're when you're sick and doing that. So uh, yeah. Um, Hope you all are doing well because I got everybody here. So um, just a real quick reminder, we have uh, chapter three homework and chapter three idea due on Friday. We're going to wrap up chapter three today and have our first discussion. So uh, I tried to reiterate this point, but I want to make sure we're clear that you do not need to have anything prepared for the discussion. Or well, I shouldn't say that. You do not need to submit anything for the discussion. You should prepare for the discussion. Make sure you read through it and answer the questions. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is purely for informational purposes to try to get everybody a better understanding of what it is we're talking about with respect to the chapters. Uh, for the homework, by the way, if you've started working on the homework and uh, tried to take the look at the UWC materiality worksheet, you probably looked at this and said, what is this fiasco that Dr. Barnes has gotten me into? I will explain a little bit of it. Uh, suffice to say that is this is probably the most subjective thing we're going to do in the entire course. So you're going to feel like you don't know what you're doing, and you will join literally hundreds of other students who have taken this class previous to you that do not know what they're doing. It's not that you get the numbers right. I know that's not gratifying as an accountant. You want to always have the numbers right. The goal of this exercise is not to get numbers correct. It's to use proper judgment in your determination of the numbers. But we'll talk about what that entails here in just a bit. So um, let's go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about the concept of materiality. Now, uh, this is one of those things. That, yeah, sorry, is your question? Sorry, but really quick, just for like the idea for, I couldn't remember if you said, do you, you want proof of like the tutorial? The way? tutorial stuff is just the informational for this you don't need to do the tutorial. All I need, in, all I need to proof of is the questions that are specifically asked on the problems. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, all right, so materiality is one of those things that used to be one of my favorite things to talk about it, and it's because it's numeric and heavily numeric, and I've, I've over time uh, gotten more of a loathing of materiality. I don't, I won't say I dislike materiality, I still enjoy talking about it. There are some things that are very confusing about materiality, and plus, if you're planning on sitting for the CPA exam, the AICPA is never consistent with how they approach materiality. It is always very confusing, which that's probably the reason that it's, it's led to my not liking it as much. That being said, it's fascinating in the approach and how it fits within the auto vernacular. So let's go ahead and uh, harken back about a week ago. So remember the first lecture, I remember that I talked about this thing called reasonable assurance. If you've forgotten that, by the way, that's a bad thing, because that's one of the most important things I've talked about so far. So um, when I say, when I say, does everybody remember reasonable assurance? Even if you don't remember it, you should nod your head, okay? I'm not gonna call you out on this one. So does everybody remember this idea of reasonable assurance that I talked about? All right, see everybody nodding their head. That's good, okay, that's good. So what did I say about reasonable assurance? Well, remember I said that we don't use, we use this term reasonable assurance because absolute assurance is not possible. We cannot achieve absolute assurance. We do not have infinite time. We don't have infinite resources. So we just want to get a reasonable assurance that what we're stating is correct. That is our goal. That is our goal as auditors to achieve that reasonable assurance. And, and by the way, when we get later on in the course, what we're going to find out is reasonable assurance is our realistically our highest level of assurance we can achieve. It is considered to be very high levels of assurance. We're going to talk about giving lower levels of assurance in other contexts later on. But this is considered to be a very high level of assurance, even though it's not absolute assurance. That being said... An auditor designs an audit to provide reasonable assurance of detecting misstatements that are of sufficient magnitude to affect the judgment of reasonable financial statement users, okay? So in other words, we may identify that there's a problem, but we may judge it to not be a significant enough problem for us to spend time on. It's a little bit like uh, anybody carry change in their pocket. I try not to do that anymore. Um, uh, usually I don't pay a lot for things for cash. And the reason why is I don't like carrying change in my pocket. But if you, uh, if you, you know, like say you're kind of jingling a change in your pocket, you're walking down the street and a penny falls out, you're probably like, that penny doesn't matter. I'm not going to waste the time to spend down to pick it up, you know. But if you're jingling change in the pocket and you, and you drop like this gold coin that's worth ten thousand dollars, you're probably going to chase that even if it goes down the sewer. Okay, so it really kind of depends on what the situation, what the circumstance is, and that's what we mean by materiality. 
It's a potential effect of a misstatement as uh, to decisions made by a reasonable user of the financial statements. And something that I always talked about uh, with respect to this course, I say that materiality thresholds are kind of considered an aggregate, but they're very subjective in how we approach them. It's different for every person. And so I said, what if, uh, what if I stole your wallet, okay? How much money would you have to have in the wallet to, before you'd really cry foul? And I'd say, would you have a dollar? And some students like, yeah, a dollar. You spent daily any of my money, Dr. Barnes. I'm making sure you can okay? By the way, I'm not going to steal your wallet, all right? That's, that's not my goal here. But say, if you stole your wallet, it's like uh, you'd say, I don't care about the dollar. I just really want to make sure I get my ID and my credit cards back. So what about if it's $10? Then you're a little bit more concerned. If it's $100, very concerned. So it, the, the, your concern goes up as that level of, as that amount goes up. And so that's, uh, there's a threshold that we achieve where we say, this is concerning to me. This is affecting my decisions and something I need to be concerned about. Now, this is reflected in the audit report. The audit report actually has the, in the PCOB unqualified report has the statement, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of the company. Now, what is that saying? It's not saying, what you're reading is exactly accurate. There's a lot of accounting theory we can go into. We could talk about there's never going to be accounting exact accuracy in accounting because accounting is an imprecise science. You never get perfect accuracy. But even if we knew what the perfectly accurate number was, we would be saying as auditors, we're close enough to that. We are close enough to the correct number. That is all that we're trying to accomplish. So it's an important part of audit planning is to determine overall materiality for the financial statements, which we call planning materiality. That's what we call it in this course. You may hear it in other situations. You may hear it just referred to as overall materiality and decide on tolerable misstatement for significant accounts and disclosures. So planning materiality is materiality for the financial statements as a whole. And this idea of tolerable misstatement is the materiality at the account or disclosure level. So we need to walk through the steps of determining those. Now, a lot of this is not very intuitive, and some of it is actually counterintuitive, which means it not only it not only does it not make sense, but some of the things that should make sense, we do the exact opposite. And I'm going to try to walk you along this path, because while it's fascinating, it is confusing. So bear with me as we start talking about this. So our steps are to determine that overall, that planning materiality. Once we've done that, we're going to assign tolerable misstatement to each account. And then we're going to evaluate audit findings. We're going to evaluate the findings. Now, we're going to do those first two steps. We can't actually do the third step right now because that occurs at the end of the audit once we've done all the test work. But we can do the planning phase and we can actually talk about the overall materiality and tolerable statement. In fact, that's your homework assignment. That's one of the things you have to do for homework is to actually assess overall materiality or planning materiality and tolerable statement. All right, so let's get into the mix. Let's talk about how we're going to assess this. Some of it pretty straightforward. Some of it makes no sense. The first thing that doesn't make sense is how do we actually determine planning materiality? So the maximum amount by which the auditor believes the financial statements could be misstated and still not affect the decisions of users. Is a $1 state misstatement big enough to affect decisions of users? No, $10, no, $100, maybe, $1,000, definitely. Some amount we actually determine is going to be amount. Sorry? Can I close it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good, good call. Uh, so there's gonna be some amount that we're going to determine. So how do we determine what the amount is? Well, the auditing standards, both PCOB and ASB auditing standards, require the auditor to establish a materiality amount for the financial statements as a whole. So these standards say, you need to determine what materiality is if you're going to do an audit. You know what they don't tell you? How to do that, okay? Which is why I've got the Jackie Chan meme on the, on the, on the uh, screen, okay? Because that doesn't make any sense. They do not provide specific guidance on how to determine what planning materiality is. By the way, auditing standards are notorious for that. They'll tell you that you have to do something without providing any guidance of how to do it. So uh, that's just like governmental agencies right there to do that for you. So like say, do it, we're not gonna tell you how to do it. So let's talk about how we do it. What are some general guidelines that we follow? Well, there's going to be qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis involved here. So let's talk about the quantitative factors first. We're gonna have a benchmark for which we establish and we're gonna use to establish overall materiality. Our most common one is going to be income or loss before income taxes. In fact, you can actually ignore where it says loss. It's just going to be income before income taxes or earnings before taxes, whatever you want to call it. If it's a loss, we generally don't use that number because that's a negative number and negative numbers are generally not good to operate from. So it's usually just going to be income before income taxes. We can also use assets, revenues, net assets, total equity. We'll talk about when those situations arise in the next slide. 
But basically, we're going to take one number out of the financial statements, out of the, usually out of the. Uh, so, well, I guess it, it could be either. It could be income statement or, or uh, balance sheet. Take one number, and we're going to multiply it by a given percentage. And that's our basis. That is going to be our quantitative basis for this. However, we are not done. We are not done. We're moving on to some other stuff. So we're going to consider qualitative factors as well. And what a qualitative factor means is say, based on what happens in this particular area, this may change the percentage or the amount that we use for materiality. Usually these are factors that contribute to risk associated with the audit. So if we consider there to be high risk associated with the audit, we're going to say, all right, we need to make materiality a lower amount to address this higher risk. Usually materiality will be adjusted downward. It's very rare for materiality to be adjusted upward, at least not at the financial statement level. We'll talk about the tolerable misstatement level here in just a second. But at the financial statement level, usually we don't adjust materiality upward. We usually just only adjust it downward to address risk. So what are some reasons that we might actually adjust materiality? Good one be material misstatement in prior years. You're working for a client. The client has misstated their numbers previously. History is the best indicator of what happens in the future. So if they misstated my numbers in the previous year, they're likely to do so in the current year. Misstatement represents a risk. Risk is something that we want to address. So we're going to make that number smaller. Because when we make materiality smaller, we do more test work. And more test work makes sense if we're considered a higher risk area. There's a high risk of fraud. If we think that the company is a subject of fraud, we may want to do more work to check that. If they have potential loan covenant violations, is everybody familiar with the idea of loan covenants? Has anybody heard that, I guess I should say? So a loan covenant is basically when a company takes out a loan from a bank, they have certain criteria that they are required to meet. A lot of those tend to be focused on financial ratios, like their debt to equity cannot exceed three. They can't have more than three times the debt than they do equity. Or they've got to maintain a current ratio of 1.2 or something like that. Companies are often put in situations where their performance affects how they actually maintain those ratios. And so they may act in certain ways to try to or try to make sure they don't violate the ratios. Because if, if a ratio or a, a certain me measure goes below a certain point, then they may that, that loan becomes due. They have to pay the loan off immediately. So if there's a high risk of violating those loan covenants, those particular metrics that are used to measure loans that do then that could create, create a higher risk that we have to be concerned with. There's also small amounts may cause the entity to miss forecasted revenues or earnings affecting the trend in, uh, in earnings. So this a good example of this would be, say that we've got, a, uh, we've got a, a client that barely made profit. They had a small amount of profit this particular year. So we may say they had $100,000 in profit, even though it's a multi-billion dollar company. So if there's a misstatement of a million dollars, that misstatement could cause earnings to go from positive to negative. And that would be something, even if material, even if million dollars is not a material amount for the company, we would consider it in terms of materiality just because of the fact that it changes profit from being positive to negative. Or if the entity operates in a volatile business environment, has complex operations, or operates in a highly regulated industry, areas where it's going to be heavily scrutinized and it's going to be uh, there's going to be problems where there's risks associated with the particular business model. <laughs> These are all things that can contribute to those qualitative factors that we talked about. And a qualitative factor, like I said, is going to be a way for us to adjust that materiality amount at the overall level anyway. So let's use some guidance. Let's talk about some guidance that you guys are going to use moving forward. So for most companies that we're going to talk about in this course, they're going to be profit-oriented companies, whether that be a public company or a private company. Usually for those companies, we're going to use income before taxes. That's going to be our benchmark. And the rule of thumb or the guidance, I, I try not to use idioms, but this is the this is what they talk about in the standards. The uh, the guidance that they use, the general guideline is 5% of income before taxes. This is our quantitative basis. So given no other information about a company, if I say, what is a good way for establishing materiality? You should say 5% of income before taxes. That's before any other information. Now, there are some exceptions to this that we need to scrutinize and be very, very careful about, okay? First of all, not-for-profit companies. Does it make sense to use income before taxes if the company does not, does not exist for the purpose of generating income? 
Their whole goal is their whole goal is to you know better the world. They usually like charitable organizations. They do not have a profit unless you're the NFL. The NFL is a not-for-profit organization, but they generate lots of profit. But uh, that's neither here nor there. All right. So I I don't know. Did the NFL recently change to a for-profit filing? I remember reading something about this. I don't. We're, I'm getting distracted. Sorry, guys. All right. So uh, yeah, uh, not-for-profit company. They're not in the business of generating profit. Not in business of generating income. So it doesn't make sense to use income before taxes. In that case, we might use total revenues or total assets. That would be one exception where we'd use a different quantitative basis. Another, an asset-based company like an investment group or a mutual fund. If you're familiar with the structure of those companies, these are companies that possess massive amounts of assets to generate relatively small amounts of income. They do generate income, but it's a very small amount of their overall financial uh, profile. So for companies like that, we want to use something along asset basis. We want to use total assets and net assets because they're they're, they're basically uh, built on these assets. They, their entire operation is based on these assets that they hold. So those are the exceptions. Yes. So I have a question about when is this 5% of income for income taxes? Does that mean 5% like, is that talking about the misstatement being 5% of so that's just how that's just how we set the planning materiality. So let's say that uh, the company is like 10, uh, $10 million dollars, and we're going to use uh, five percent of income before taxes. We would say planning materiality is five hundred thousand dollars. So five percent times ten million dollars, their income before taxes. So when we start evaluating misstatements, we're going to use that amount, that five hundred thousand dollars, as our basis. If it's if there's misstatements above five hundred thousand dollars, that's where we start getting into our concerns, and we'll talk about how to evaluate that here in just a bit. But this is our calculation for that. All right. So is everybody on board with this calculation? Does everybody feel comfortable with this? Uh, you don't may not, not may not be comfortable with the idea of the qualitative adjustments, but for the quantitative calculations, you think you could do that? In other words, could you multiply 5% times something? Does everybody feel comfortable in doing that? If you can't multiply 5% times something, then you're in the wrong profession. All right. You're in the wrong profession. But I'm assuming everybody's good with that so far. All right. Here's where things get a little bit confusing, okay? Once we've established planning materiality, once we've established overall materiality for the financial statements, we have to assign materiality to individual accounts. Because as we know, financial statements, the, the balance sheet and income statement are comprised of individual accounts. Now we're gonna talk about this concept later, but for the most part, we're gonna focus on the balance sheet. And the reason why is all of the income statements tend to flow from the balance sheet so we're going to focus on the idea of the counts in the balance sheet. By doing so, we will actually affect the income statement as well. So if you look up here and you say, well, Dr. Barnes, you're missing all the income statement accounts. Don't worry about it. I promise you we'll test the income statement accounts. We're just testing them through the balance sheet. But we'll talk about how that works later on in the course. All right. So tolerable statement statement is intended to establish a scope of audit procedures for individual accounts. We could also say individual disclosures, but disclosures tend to be non-monetary, so we don't talk about those as much. It's going to be mostly account focused. So there's a few important things to remember about tolerable misstatement. First of all, auditors generally set maximum tolerable misstatement for a single account between 50 and 75% of planning materiality. This is our first confusing point because this always gets some confusion. Basically, I will decide upon what percentage I want to set it at. It's, if I believe that there's a high risk of misstatement, I may set that percentage lower. If I say there's a low risk of misstatement, then I may set that percentage higher. But I'm going to set some percentage, okay? We'll say 75%. Every single account that I assign tolerable misstatement to can have no more than 75% of my total planning materiality assigned as tolerable misstatement. So in that example where I was using $500,000 as my planning materiality, I start assigning that to individual accounts and I say 75% is my maximum. No single account can have tolerable misstatement above 75%, or I guess that would be 75% times 500, that's like 375,000. So 375,000 is the maximum amount that I can assign for tolerable misstatement in any one account. Okay, that does not mean that I can't assign a number lower than that. Like if I've got a really small account that's only a few thousand dollars, I may set, set that tolerable misstatement like zero because it's effectively not, there's probably no chance of misstatement. Or if it's a few thousand dollars, I may set tolerable misstatement a thousand dollars. But I can set it at random amounts, but the highest I can go is 75%. Or if later on in another audit, I say this is a higher risk company, I'm going to set it at 50%, then the highest I can set is 50% of planning materiality. It's not a range. It's a signed assignment that we actually hold on to and we use for the entire audit. Okay. So the examples that we're going to look at, most of this, most of the ones we're going to look at for, for this, these exercises, they're going to be 75%. And 
In fact, the earthware exercise is actually 75% of planning materiality. That means that you use 75% for every single account as your maximum. So that's the first thing. And it's really confusing because everybody wants to use that range of 50 to 75%. In fact, I have a story for you that I'm not going to share right now, but it's about one of my battles with McGraw Hill and about this particular range. One of the things that I told them, I'm 100% right. I have a PhD in this stuff. And they told me I was wrong. So uh, that's a fun story for another time when we actually have extra time. But uh, anyway, so, uh, set it at 50, between 50 to 75%. Once we set that percentage, that's the percentage we use. Secondly, we generally cap the size of aggregate tolerable misstatement for all accounts to three or four times planning materiality. So aggregate tolerable misstatement is just as it sounds. We take all of our tolerable misstatements, we add them together, and then the total of that should be somewhere between three to four times planning materiality, or no more than three to four times. You Again, you set that as a, as a standard and you keep that. The example that we're going to use is going to be four times planning materiality, but it could be less than that. We could say only three times. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are saying that our tolerable misstatements in whole can be many times larger than our planning materiality. That doesn't make intuitive sense, does it? We're saying that if we add all these tolerable misstatements together, they're much larger than what we can accept as materiality for the financial statements. That seems weird, right? So why do I say that? Why do I actually make this statement? Why do I say that we can actually have it as much larger than planning materiality? The reason why is because we do not expect accounts to be misstated. Tolerable misstatement is effectively saying this is the maximum amount this one account can be misstated. Does that mean every single account is going to have that maximum misstatement in it? No, we hope, we expect as auditors that we're not gonna have a misstatement at all in our accounts. Most of our accounts should be stated properly. So we're assuming that even though we're setting tolerable misstatement for every single account, that most of our accounts will be correct. So we can set this number much, much larger than planning materiality, and we still we're gonna assume that we're probably gonna be much less than our planning materiality once we add all of our actual misstatements together. So that's why we say all of our tolerable misstatements can exceed our planning materiality. They can be on a magnitude of three to four times larger. So if you look at that and get confused, that's the reason why, that's the explanation. All right. Again, really confusing, but uh, there's a reason for it. All right. At the account level, the lower tolerable misstatement is the more extensive the required audit testing. Now, we've already talked about this concept. If you make it an amount lower, you have to test more because you're concerned about smaller errors. And so a smaller error can affect materiality. So we have to actually test much more, uh, much smaller transactions, more transactions to make sure that we get proper coverage. So we like numbers to be large as auditors. Now, that goes against what I was just telling you. I was saying that so we could set numbers smaller if we think that there's a risk. And now I'm telling you I'd like to have a number that's larger. In fact, if I had my druthers as an auditor, if I'm testing a, co a company that's a billion-dollar company, I would love my materiality to be a billion dollars because then I don't have to do any testing at all. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Okay, that's completely ridiculous. But that would be what I'd like to do. I'd like to walk in and say, all right, sign the audit report. I'm done. Going to Hawaii. All right. That, that, would, be, that would be all I would do. Okay. But the problem is, is that's not the way it works in the real world. So we are going to do what's called strategic assignment of tolerable misstatement. So we can control the testing of individual accounts while still retaining planning materiality. Now, this is the one that's probably the most confusing out of all. I've already talked about a couple of really confusing things. This is the one that gets really confusing. So what do I mean by strategic assignment? So I'm gonna use an analogy for this and you all know me, I love to use my food analogies. So let's plan a family dinner, okay? Because a lot of you guys, you went home for the holidays, you either Thanksgiving or Christmas or both, and you had family dinners, like big gatherings of the family. I've got uh, six people in my immediate family. I've got me, I've got my mother, I've got my brother, my sister-in-law, my two nieces, okay? And so I like to eat. I love food, okay? I, I sit down for Thanksgiving dinner. I usually have at least two plates because I, I just enjoy myself during those meals, okay? My sister-in-law is the same way, but, but more so. She's like about my height. She's like half my width. All right. She is, she is like slender. She's got the metabolism of, I, I don't know. It's like, she's got the metabolism of somebody who's like uh, five years old. She just goes through calories like nobody's business. So she eats more than I do. And I don't know how she does it, where, where it all goes. It's just always constantly moving. Then we've got my mom. My mom is 81 years old and she'll like take a spoonful of food and then she'll be like, wow, I am so full. Okay. My brother, he doesn't have much of an appetite. He eats about half of what I do. And we got my nieces. My nieces, if you give them, if you give them like peanut butter and jelly, or if you give them macaroni and cheese, they will eat till a lot, till the cows come home. You give them a Thanksgiving dinner where everything's been worked on and hard prepared, great food. And they're like, 
I'm not hungry. Okay. So the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that we all have different criteria on what we eat. Okay. And if I used one person at that table and said, let's actually just multiply that times six, and that would be enough food for that t- plate. So, so if we used me as this example saying, I, we're going to make enough food so that we can have six, six times of what uh, Dr. Barnes eats. My family doesn't call me Dr. Barnes, but you guys do. All right. So uh, six times of what Dr. Barnes eats, there's going to be way too much food because I eat more than most of the people at that table. If we do six times of what my nieces eat, there's going to be no food. Okay. There's going to be no food at the table. So we have to strategically assign based on what we think each individual will eat. Now, we don't do a very good job of that. We usually have tons of leftovers, but I actually like that because I love Thanksgiving leftovers. But uh, if we were trying to get just exactly enough food that everybody would have enough, we would have to think about every single individual and what they would eat. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to consider a few factors. We're going to consider size of an account, the activity that occurs in that account, the complexity associated with account, and then risk associated with account relative to the other accounts in assigning tolerable misstatement. Okay, we're going to consider all of those factors. So I want to walk through a few examples with you. I want to actually look at your assignment that you're going to be doing on uh, on Friday. And we're going to just kind of look at a starting point to see what we're going to be doing with that. Because again, it is very subjective and very confusing. And again, I don't think anybody's going to sit down on this assignment and say, I perfectly understand this. Dr. Barnes explained it so well, it makes crystal clear. You're going to be sitting for this assignment and you're going to be like, this man is insane, Okay. And that you're probably correct, okay? You're probably correct. But that being said, this is something that is, because of subjectivity, is necessary. Is just going to be naturally confusing. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Let's take a look at what the materiality work papers look like. So first of all, very important, before you do this, before you sit down to do this, review these materiality guidelines. They're in the workbook, but they're also a, they're also separately uh, given in the assignment. These are the, the auditor. The auditor's co- company name is Willis and Adams. These actually uh, tell you how you actually perform materiality testing. And there's a few guidelines you need to be very, very aware of. So first of all, they actually use the materiality guidelines of four times, tolerable maintenance, four times planning materiality, and 75% is a maximum for each account, okay? They use kind of the same guidelines we talked about for assigning planning to materiality. They start with the income before taxes, but they default to others based on certain circumstances. So very consistent with what we've already talked about. But make sure you read these because you want to make sure that you're clear on how to do this. So let's just go ahead and do an uh, example. So you kind of see here, um, they've got some data here. We're going to actually be assigned it for, audit, or for the audit. And what do we say is our general default for uh, for the measurement base that we're going to use for planning materiality? So it's going to be pre-tax income, okay? Now, this is going to be if this is a profit-oriented company. Now, you guys have already done some research on this company. Would you say Earthwork Clothiers is a profit-oriented company? They are. They are absolutely a profit-oriented company. So this seems good, okay? The only other thing that might give us concern is if we think that there's volatility in the income amounts. Now, volatility is a subjective term, but they actually define it in the work papers, okay? They actually define that in the materiality work papers. So you might have to determine, is volatility in place? And if so, do I need to change my measurement base, okay? I'm not going to tell you yes or no. I'm going to tell you do your research because they actually define that in the work paper. So you'll actually be able to answer that question. Absolutely answer that question 100% certainty if you do the research. If you don't read it, then you're not going to be able to answer that question. So that's going to be something I have you do. But let's go ahead and just default to pre-tax income. And as Holden said, I believe, I believe Holden said 5%. Okay. Uh, so 5%. Oops. Never luck. 5%. Okay. So that's kind of our gu- guideline. Now, can we adjust that? Do we have factors that we might want to adjust that with? Maybe, but let's just stick with 5% right now. 5% sounds like a good st- place to start. So that gives us planning materiality of 3.5 million because this is in thousands. All right, once we have actually plugged that in, and by the way, you will have some other things that you need to answer down here, but I'm not gonna answer them because uh, I'm not you guys. All right, but uh, you will need it as part of your assignment, but let's go over to the work paper. And if you've done this, what you're gonna find out is that the work paper automatically populates this 3.5 million down here. Okay. And what it's going to tell you is it's going to say, what is the ratio of tolerable misstatement to planning materiality? And currently it's 1.7. And if you look at this little star down here, it should be below four times materiality. So remember that four, the aggregate tolerable misstatements need to be a total less than four, which is good. We're far less than that, but there's a problem. There's a whole bunch of yellow boxes where we still haven't put in numbers, which guess what? That's what you guys get to do. That's what you guys get to do. Okay, so you get to actually plug in these numbers and plug in them in. 
Now, there's, I think, uh, eight of them that you have to actually put in. Your goal is, has anybody ever watched The Price is Right? Okay, you know that to get as close as you can without going over. That's the goal here. You want this number to be as close to four as you possibly can without going over, okay? Why is that the case? What If you get to like 2.5, you could be really proud of yourself. So that's well below four. Dr. Barnes is gonna be so proud of me. What does that mean if you're the auditor if that number is 2.5? You've made those totals that are in those accounts much smaller than they need to be. Those tolerable misstatements are much smaller than they could be. If those tolerable misstatements are small, what does that mean about the work that you have to do? You have to do more work. Would you rather do more work or less work as a human being? If you say more work, I'm kicking you out of the classroom. Less work. Okay, you saw where I was going with that. Okay. So if we make the numbers larger in tolerable misstatement, it means less work for us as auditors. So that's why we want to get as close to four as we can. Yes. It would be more accurate, and sometimes we have to make those numbers lower, especially if we think there's higher levels of risk. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do our best allocation so that we can minimize our work while still falling beneath that planning materiality amount. Okay, and if we if we do that and we follow and we have number above planning materiality, like our, our aggregate misstatements end up being above materiality, that's an, another concept. But for the most part, our goal is, is that we want to minimize our work because we have precious resources, but we still want to be accurate, still want to be within materiality. So yes, you are correct. We could make this number really, really small. We could also end up working 100 hours a week. Now, you're Truman students, you probably already worked 100 hours a week, okay? But that's not the way that it works in the real world. People are not going to really be uh, positive or very, very uh, accepting if you say 100 hours a week for the next eight weeks. You're going to be like, new job. Thank you very much. All right. So that's our goal here. Let's just go ahead and let's talk really quickly about how we do this. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. So first of all, make sure that you remember when you're assigning materiality, it can be no more than 75% of that 3.5 million or whatever the number that you come up with. Okay. So we're going to assign these numbers and we'll just do a couple of these. Uh, I'm going to do one that's not plugged in. I'm going to do another one that is plugged in and talk about why that number they came up with. Okay. So Cash and cash equivalents. Cash and cash equivalents is one of the ones that you have to do. So what did I say the dimensions that we're going to evaluate on? We're going to talk about the size of the account. How big is this account relative to the financial statements? It's pretty big. It's about $80 million. Okay, so size is pretty large. Okay, what about activity for cash? Does cash get used pretty frequently in transactions? Well, I would say occasionally, you know, once or twice every second okay so yeah it's pretty frequently used but like what about complexity is cash a very complex item cash is probably the simplest item on the balance sheet what you have is what you get okay so the complexity is really low and there's very little risk associated with cash at least at least from a financial reporting perspective now can it be stolen absolutely but that's not what we're concerned about we're concerned about the reporting amount so complexity and risks tend to be fairly low so we can make this number really small so let's just go ahead. Let's set this to 100,000. I'm going to set this to $100,000. Actually, no, we'll make it a little bit larger. We'll say 400,000, okay? So as you can see, that's much larger, smaller, smaller. It's actually less than 1% of the account balance, but it tells you uh, tells you that it's uh, well within that 75% that I set as the maximum, but it's 1% uh, of the account balance right here, okay? So pretty small amount. Let's talk about this one over here. And by the way, you would have to provide an explanation for it. What would be the explanation? It's a large account, okay? It has a lot of activity, but it's a very simple audit, okay? It, it doesn't, there's no complexity to it, very little risk associated with it. So that's all you'd have to do. Let's talk about inventory. What is the nature of inventory for this company, Earthwear Clothiers? We'd say inventory is an important account. They're a retail trade company. Of course, it's an important account. So it's probably one of their most important accounts, if not the most important account. So if that's the case, we say it's a large account, yeah, it's the second largest account on the financials, looks like actually the third largest because they've retained earnings down there too. But property plant equipment is larger, but inventory is really close. So we can say property, because of inventory, we're going to set tolerable misstatement at a pretty high level. Okay. And they set it pretty high. They set $2.3 million as tolerable misstatement, which if you look, this is really close to that 75% threshold that we set. That's close to that 75%. In fact, they could make it a little bit larger. This is, again, assuming that we use the 3.5 million as our planning materiality, okay? But we said it at 2.3 million, which is uh, about 2% of the account balance. Based on these current numbers, we probably could set a larger. You don't need to, because that's one that's given to you. But that's the number they set. And let's think about this. Size of the account, very large, okay? Activity, 
a retail inventory company is going to have a lot of transactions associated with inventory. Okay. What about complexity? Does inventory have more complexity than cash? Certainly more complexity. And given the nature of the industry, it could actually be fairly complex depending on what basis they use. And risk associated with reporting, certainly higher. It's not super high risk, but it's going to be certainly higher than uh, several other accounts. And it's going to be very prominent in the organization. So I would say we want to set this number very high, as high as we possibly can, realistically can. Now, if I did someplace like KPMG, for example, like an accounting firm, would inventory be as critical there? They're a service company. I hope not. The only thing they sell are those, those KPMG hats that golfers wear. Okay. I've got stories about that too. You don't want to hear. I'm going to gripe a lot. All right. So... That would be an example of what you're doing here. And you're doing this for all the accounts. You're trying to make a determination based on those factors. And again, your goal here, after all is said and done, is you want to make this number as close to four as you can without going over. If you're at 3.99999 repeating, you've done the perfect work. You've done perfect work there. So that's going to be your task. And that's how we have set materiality. I will tell you right now, unless you work together, no one person in this room will have the same answer as another person. And if you can work together. That's absolutely fine. It's just... If you work on this independently, everybody's going to come up with a different answer. That's fine, too. The goal here is not to get an absolutely correct answer. The goal is to understand the process and if you're following the intuition correctly. So we'll talk more about that on Friday. All right, let's wrap up the discussion of materiality. So this is actually completed the end of the evaluation of audit findings. Based on the results of audit procedures con uh, conducted, the auditor aggregates misstatements from each account or disclosure. Now, keep a note of this, okay? This is an aggregation of actual misstatements, not tolerable misstatement. This is an aggregation of actual misstatement. Later on, we're going to talk about how we test accounts. We're going to talk about how we actually collect evidence and we determine what the balances should be in accounts. We're going to compare the amounts that we believe are correct to what the client has reported. The difference between those are called misstatements. If we take all of those numbers and add them together, we've got an aggregate misstatement. And these are actual misstatements that we have observed. What is our goal? Our goal is, is that if we sum all of those numbers together, every misstatement that we observed, it's less than planning materiality. Okay. Also, what we'd like to observe is we'd like to say that if we observe an, a, a misstatement in a single account, that the single account misstatement is less than our tolerable misstatement. Remember, we actually set tolerable misstatement for individual accounts. We say this is the maximum amount that can be misstated. We want to make sure that any individual misstatement is less than the tolerable misstatement for that account, and the sum of all misstatements is less than planning materiality. If we do that, then we can make a determination on whether the financial statements are fairly presented. Okay. Now, it's important to note that information collected during the course of audit may cause the auditor to revise its assessment of materiality, both levels, planning materiality and tolerable misstatements. What this means is, let's say that I'm working over the course of the audit, and I think this client is extremely low risk. But then I find some incidences of fraud that might have might be taking place, and the client's not very forthwith on communicating with me and not cooperating with me. Remember, I set my uh, threshold. I said tolerable statement, the maximum is seventy five percent of planning materiality. I may set that number lower. I may say let's set it now to sixty percent, or I may adjust the qualitative basis. I may say I was originally using five percent of income before taxes. I'm going to change that to four point five percent because I think that there's a higher risk of misstatement for this company. This can occur during the audit, okay? We can change those numbers during the audit if we find reason to do so. That's what this paragraph is saying. So what I know this guy, the auditor does what? They aggregate misstatements from each account or a class of transactions, including known and likely misstatements. Now, again, these are the actual misstatements that we calculate as part of our testing. We can compare those total misstatements to overall materiality. So we compare the sum of those misstatements that we calculated to our planning materiality. If those misstatements are less than overall materiality, we're going to say the financial statements are fine. Now, let's think about what that just says right there, okay? Let's say that I've got 10 misstatements, all right? And those 10 misstatements total $1 million. My planning materiality is $2 million. What does that mean? It means that the total misstatements that I observe are less than my materiality. They're less than what I can accept for misstatements. In other words, the misstatements in total are not material. They are not material. And so I can actually say, I don't care. I'm going to move on with my life. That million dollars does not matter. What if I add all my misstatements together and they are $3 million? And I compare that to planning materiality, which is $2 million again. 
In that situation, I'm going to say the financial statements are materially misstated. The total of all these misstatements is greater than the amount that I can accept. And so that's when I'm going to have a problem, okay? That's when a problem is. And there's a couple of things that we can do as auditors. The most obvious one is to go to the client and say, hey, your financial statements are wrong. You need to make an adjustment. And if the client says, hey, peachy, we're going to do that right now, all right? I don't think they'll say peachy, but, you know, if they do, maybe, okay? So they're going to go ahead and they're going to make the adjustment. If that's the case, everything's fine. If we can't convince the client to adjust, that's when we start getting in those situations of the financial statements are misstated. Here's a bad audit report. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're concerned about. So again, a lot of terms that were used here. Again, in this slide, we're talking about the actual misstatements observed as a, over, as a result of testing. And we're comparing those to our planning materiality in total. All right, any questions? Trust me when I say you will have them, okay? You will have them, okay? But for right now, I think we're in good place. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up with our discussion. Okay, so I gave you some information about earth workflow of the years, and I wanted you to answer these questions. And I think these questions are good for understanding the, the basis of the company. So we've already talked about this in this class. Earthwork Clothiers is a retail inventory company, very similar to like an LLB Beanstein company. And again, just for context, this textbook was originally written back in the late 1990s when this was a far more prominent part of the economy than it is today. I do think it's a little bit of an outdated case. That being said, the work papers, the documents that we're going to be working with are very good. They're very well done for the most part. So that's why I like using this particular case. So they actually had to do a little bit of background reading. And uh, you will notice that if you read through this background, they were incorporated in 1975. They went public or uh, decided to go public in 1986. And Wilson Adams, even though they're not commonly uh, auditor for publicly traded companies, they were they were started in 1986 and they've been on the audit for since then. OK, which is a very long time. It's almost 40 years, which, you know, nobody's been alive that long except for me. Anyway, uh, they've been growing at a steady pace. Uh, they've got a lot of competition in their industry. They've got some competitors they have to be worried about. So that's something that we have to be concerned with. Um, they actually have had some turnover in their uh, in their management positions, which was very relevant that they talked about. And they also had a brand new accounting information system that they in, uh, they in integrated, not in the current year under audit, but the year right before that. And they had some kinks that had to work out with that, but it looks like the current year, everything's fine. So that was kind of a summary of everything that we talked about. And I asked you to answer some questions. Okay, I asked you to answer some questions. Are there any business risks that the auditor should consider a part of this decision? So again, this is engagement planning and continu or engagement continuation. So Wilson Adams is the current auditor. We're saying, do we want to continue auditing? We've done it for 37 years. Do we want to do it for another 38th year? I guess that's not right. That would be 36 years. It's 36th year, 35th year. 30th. Do we want to continue doing it? Which you can probably guess this is a foregone conclusion, but let's go ahead and make sure we do the analysis, all right? Any business risk the auditor should consider for our decision. So I identified three pretty obvious ones, though there are some other smaller ones. So what, what did you guys identify? Did you identify any business risk? Oh. The first one I said was a bit of a controller. Okay. She's not that experience. She's been in the company for 14 years, but she's Okay, so I think that's one of the biggest ones, okay? The controller, the old controller left, and they've got a brand new controller, which the brand new controller has got some experience in other areas, but not necessarily the skill set that's required for this particular job. Now, can we say the controller is very relevant to financial statement preparation and auditing? Yes. So this is probably a pretty important risk, especially with respect to this particular audit. So that's one business risk that we need to be aware of. That is a big concern. What else? What other ones? The new accounting information system. Now, while the kinks may have gotten worked out, for the most part, the accounting information system is still an unknown quantity, and there could be misstatements as a result of the system being unproven. So, yeah, good one. Any other thing else? Uh, management integrity. So, management integrity, we'll, we'll talk about in just a second. There is there is an issue about that, although a small one, okay? What else? So, what about their, what they're about their inherent, inherent environment, the environment they operate in? Is there a risk associated with that? Do they have many competitors? They've got a lot of competitors. Okay, if you've got if you're if you're the only business in the industry, you probably don't are exposed to a lot of comp, 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 competitive risk. Tried to say that and it wouldn't come out. Competitive risk, but if you have a lot of comp, competitors, then there's a lot of competition. And there's a lot more risk associated with that. And they actually listed out a whole bunch of companies that are competitors with Earthware. So that's another business risk. Did anybody identify any other risks? 
that's a pretty good uh, cross section of those risks, I think. And those are the ones that I primarily was concerned about. Okay. So are there any incidents that might suggest an issue with management integrity? So you might ask, why did he give us that Excel spreadsheet if he didn't want us to do the Excel spreadsheet as part of the assignment? And there was a reason for that, because I wanted you to review the Excel spreadsheet and see if you can come up with anything. Did anybody find something about management integrity in that Excel spreadsheet? That's right. Yeah. So if we go over to work page 3.4, so looks like in 2019, I'll see if I can make this larger. Earthware's vice president of finance, Don Evans, was charged with a misdemeanor involving illegal gambling on college basketball games. Charges were dropped after Mr. Evans agreed to pay a fine of $750 and perform 50 hours community service. No other uh, illegal or ethical problems were found with Earthware's executives or any other Earthware executives. Okay. So can we say that that represents another risk? Yeah, absolutely. That's something we have to be concerned about. Okay. I would say this is a small one. Okay. But as we're going to talk about next week, there is some concern, especially when we start talking about gambling debts or gambling, uh, gambling habits that we do need to be aware of with respect to our audit. So this is something that's going to come up and be very relevant to what we talk about next week. So from this context, we're actually going to say there's a risk there. Good identification, good identification loads. All right. Oops. Come on. You can do this. So here's the question. Here's the question. Do we want to retain Earthwear Clothiers as an audit client? We're the Willis and Adams. We're, we're the Willis and Adams partners in this room right now. Okay. We're saying, do we want to go for year number 36 or not? All right. What do you guys think? How many of you guys think yes? All right. How many people think no? Okay. I think the eyes have it. And I would agree that this is a very solid client. Keep in mind, we're talking about doing business. We're talking about uh, accepting clients. This is not something we're going to have perfect clients. You're never going to have a client that's going to uh, that's going to have every single thing lined up perfectly. There are going to be some risks associated with any client. If it was a perfect client, there'd be no need for an audit. All right. So that is something we have to be aware of. And this is an immaculate client. This is actually much nicer than any client I ever audited when I worked in the real world. There are certainly fewer problems here, especially for a publicly traded company. So I would say this is easily clear cut slam dunk. And again, the indication was a strong clue that they've been auditing this company for 35 years and getting ready to do a 36 one. You don't stay on a client that long if you've got problems with it. So I think this is a pretty easy one. And by the way, it's really important that we decided to keep this client because if we had said no, I don't have any other examples for you guys to work on. So uh, it would have been a much shorter class. there had been a lot less work associated with this. So uh, the good news is now I have assignments for you guys because we've actually got an audit client that we can work on. Yeah, I know. I don't work. Yeah, I got news for you. Even if everybody had said no in the classroom, you guys still would have been doing the work papers. Okay, I would have I would have trumped you on that one. I would have vetoed your no, and I would have said, yes, we're going to continue off this client because you guys are partners, but I'm the ultimate partner. I'm the ultimate partner. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you guys on Friday.